the next speaker is Dr. Uh, it was damage control in neuro trauma, an innovating um, topic by Dr. Andres Rubiano, who got his uh, degree from the Valle University in Colombia. Then he went up to study on neuro surgery at, at El Bosque University. Since 2005, Dr. Rubiano has been one of the founders of the Institute of Medical Education in Colombia, Meditech, training postgraduate students in pre-op and medical care in advanced trauma. Later, he, were, he went to the Virginia Commonwealth University for a fellowship in neural trauma and critical care. And since 2007, he has been a researcher of global trauma and a member of the emergency um, committee of the WHO. After he came back from the US, Dr. Rubiano went to several hospitals practicing neurosurgery. He's an author in a, of a book on neurotrauma, focused on neurotrauma and neurosurgery. Dr. Rubiano. Thank you very much. We're going to speak, as, a, as it was mentioned, about the damage control in neurotrauma, especially for low resources settings. Some of the disclosures uh, in research. The damage control surgery, as we all know, was depicted a while ago by Dr. Uh, Michael Rotondo. It was described as a, an abbreviated surgery performed on critically injured patients. The first time we talk about damage control related to the neurotrauma was around 1998 when uh, an American brutal surgeon, Dr. Rinker, submitted a paper about the craniotomy in rural areas by trauma surgeons, and then he was later invited to write a paper for the newsletter in, on, in the section of neurotrauma and critical care of the American Association of Neurosurgery. He presented his views on how the rural surgeons should be trained in uh, damage control craniotomy that at the time was uh, stated as undertaking a surgery in the patients with a trauma to gain some time in case we later require a final management. About that same time, I was in this hospital to my dad is in the northern part of Bogota in Colombia. And this center was part of a quality improvement program of the Brain uh, Foundation of New York. And it was the first time that the quality improvement program was carried out outside the US. It was a process where eight Colombian hospitals uh, were involved. And for the first time, we had an idea of a neurotrauma registration approximately by doing research for this process. One of the most frequent injuries was the traumatic epidural and subdural acute uh, lesions and because or injuries and because of the number of patients and the few beds available in the ICU many of those patients were taken to a process of cranial decompression to gain some time as we waited for an ICU space we review and we found out that many of the patients that had been taken to an ample uh, cranial decompression had a different um, survival in different stage groups including the pediatric and adult patients. Thanks to that experience we undertook an exercise and we intended to publish at the time a paper reviewing all of those cases that was not 
damage control in neurotrauma focused on the early decompressive craniectomy. That idea was the description of how this technique could be used to improve the prognosis of some of those patients. We undertook the first exercise of publication. The publication was sent to three international publications and they all rejected the article. When we sent it to a trauma surgeon's magazine, we were told that we had mixed the pediatric and the adult patients, that that was not possible. But quite often they did not take into consideration the importance of describing the technique. When it was sent to a neurosurgery magazine, we were told that how was it, it was possible to use a term that had been depicted by trauma surgeons for a neurosurgery procedure. Um, the article was rejected on several occasions. Later, in the year 2004, Dr. Jeffrey Rumfeld, an Australian military surgeon, published the concept of damage control neurosurgery, making reference to something that Dr. Rinkle had already mentioned about how uh, neurosurgery, uh, a very urgent uh, neurosurgery, performed on the injured patient to prevent secondary brain injury could improve the survival and outcome. And it was described at that moment as an urgent surgery done by a neurosurgeon, but that could have some particular applications in the remote, rural, or military environments where the surgery could be performed by a general surgeon. Finally, after many years, since the year 2001, finally the article was published in the year 2009 in the uh, Journal of Surgery and Emergency. And after all of those concepts, we decided to change the name, and it was left at the early decompressive craniectomy for neurotrauma and institutional experience. As we mentioned, there were many reasons to reject our article by some of those journals. In 2010, and after the experience gathered by the military surgeons in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a publication by the military neuro or surgeon uh, group led by Dr. Amon with regards to the early decompressive craniectomy for severe penetrating and closed head injury uh, during wartime. Likewise, in that uh, supplement Dr. Richard Teff described how the damage control uh, neurosurgery could be related to the decompress decompressive early craniectomy and many of those injuries in Iraq and Afghanistan were early decompressed especially in war um, hospitals to later be transferred to final care centers. So many more aspects of the technique be began gaining momentum. One point that was really useful to us was the change of the incision. Traditionally, we had an incision of standard as a question mark, but the military uh, American surgeons retook a technique that had been used in the early uh, century, uh, 19th century, for, and that allowed in a faster way to have an ample exposure of the area to decompress as many tissues as possible. According to many of those studies, they identify the best cases for the technique. We had to consider an early aggressive cranial decompression in the every case of penetrating um, injuries and in most cases of closed head injury in war zones. And we had to exclude patients with injuries traversing the zona fatalities as called. It is the midline of brain stem. Knowing all of that, um, with our background in the year 2009, we started applying the medical and surgical military protocols for neurotrauma patients in a university hospital in Colombia that 
due to the armed conflict at that time had a high number of military patients. This uh, approach was uh, based in the availability of resources because in this type of hospital, they managed very similar resources to a combat uh, hospital. In the Middle East, the civilian hospitals in low countries are more similar in resources to many combat support hospitals than to the large trauma centers in the U.S. As part of the protocols we took, what Dr. Maddox already mentioned with regards to damage control resuscitation, Dr. Duquesne is going to speak further about that. He's one of the people with more knowledge in this area, and also Dr. Dr. Hockham and Hoy and Rick, who also worked in this topic. This was very important to us because it made possible to organize the urgency protocol, and we began publishing some articles about the experience using this type of protocol in a standardized way in civilian trauma centers. Many of the things adjusted was precisely to start the resuscitation with a low uh, or small volume and to start early in the emergency room the transfusion of hemoderivates or blood derivatives. Surprisingly to us, when we began doing the analysis, the most benefited population by this type of approach was the patients with a severe um, cranial trauma. Dr. Puyanas from the Pittsburgh University, who was one of our mentors in the process of trauma research, allowed the students of the Pittsburgh University to travel to work with our students in the city of Navy in Colombia and to assess the impact of many of those protocols in the functional results of the patients. And very importantly, we found out that after the adjustment of the protocol, the mortality after medical discharge improved importantly. Once we began the process of control damage resuscitation, the patient, we had all of the resources should be transferred to a surgical procedure and later to an ICU. Um, quite often, patients that could have injuries, especially uh, cerebral edema or er brain swelling that do not have a hematome for a second should go to an ICU and have an advanced uh, brain monitoring, including brain oxygenation, intracranial pressure, blood flow to the brain, electrical activity. But the reality is that in many of our healthcare centers in the low and middle income um, countries, we lack those technologies, so handling a patient in those conditions is going to be quite complicated because it is very difficult to make timely decisions to take those patients to surgery or not. And based on the experience since 2001, we proposed an early cranial decompression as a damage control process before taking those patients to an ICU with very um, um, low monitoring. If we have many patients with different injuries and we know the evolution of the inflammatory response in the brain that initially the ischemia the sec is secondary to the vascular injury and doesn't it doesn't have a proper response and that generates a swelling process of the brain and a brain apoptosis. So the best offer to those patients is to expand the cranial space for to prevent a process of brain hernia. And what we proposed was a hemispheric decompression before the patients were moved to the ICU to have a deep sedation of at least 72 hours after um, proving that the first four to five days, uh, the days where we have the most important swelling of the brain and following the fifth day, if the resuscitation was proper, the brain mechanisms themselves are going to impact 
the recovery process, we need to evaluate the basic monitoring of those units, including systemic oxygenation, not brain oxygenation, blood pressure, the pupil size, and the CT control. Because in many of those con uh, countries, the only way to determine if the patient is having a intracranial uh, Hypertension is to have a CAT scan to see if there is a deviation from the main line or some problems with the baseline. If the CAT scan control shows no change, then we could think about the possibility of decreasing the sedation to wake up the patient. In those images, you can see the incision used by the military surgeons and that we currently use in our centers. This allows us to further study this and thanks to the support of many, many people in the Americas that began working with us, especially Dr. David Artisan and Nancy Carden, the methodology of the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, we apply some on, uh, to some grants to assess the results in those patients and we already had the opportunity to publish some preliminary results about the benefits from this type of approach in patients with brain trauma injuries, especially with penetrating cranial wounds and cerebral or brain edema. What are the learning points? Something that is already known that the wider the craniectomy, the better for the patient. That the earlier the cranioplasty, the better for the functional recovery of the patient. In the past, when we proceeded, um, especially in Europe, in some centers, they tried to delay in as much as possible, as possible the cranioplasty. But now, we have identified that the changes related to the pressure uh, internally in the cranial area when we place the bone are very important to avoid complications like hydrocephaly that may result following this procedure. It is important to say that damage control is not a small craniectomy. One of the most important biases in many of the multi-center publications and researchers based on observation about this type of procedure has to do with the fact that sometimes a very small craniectomy is interpreted as a cranial decompression. We have noticed that in many of the environments where we have shared with some surgeons from different countries, different cases with a small craniectomies that are regarded supposedly as a cranial decompression, but it is not really a decompression, but actually it's going to provoke more damage in the brain, especially because the decompression in the edges of the bones are going to produce some infarctions related to venous decompression and hypoperfusion, especially in areas where we have the posterior brain artery. Another important point learned in this process is that definitely we need neural trauma registry in low and middle income countries. Around 80% of severe TBI patients worldwide are managed in low and middle income countries that lack the technology and the resources for advanced neural monitoring. And the fact that we are not undertaking research in those areas is preventing us from getting proper evidence to understand and identify the benefits of many of those procedures. As we all know, we have performed two attempts of randomized clinical trials in cranial decompressions. The first, the DECRA trial with many methodological failures, and the type of intervention performed was basically a bifrontal decompression, clearly establishing a limitation in the size of the craniectomy, and it is not indicated for many of those major hemispheric injuries or penetrating injuries. Now there is a second trial 
in the phase of assessment and data analysis, the rescue ICP trial from the UK. And we're all expecting the results probably by the end of the year, because depending on those results, we may have or not more evidence to support this type of intervention. That led to the new foundation guidance to be stopped as we wait for the results of that trial to adjust recommendations about cranial decompression based on those results. The review is performed periodically on this topic, so they are awaiting those results too, and definitely this is going to be very important. We published a couple of articles, the most recent in Nature, about the opportunities for research in this type of scenarios and how we cannot lose those data that we gather daily in those countries and that will be critical to generate changes in our daily clinical practice, obviously based on the resources available. Finally, understanding that this is not just the work of the neurosurgeons, this is a teamwork. It is very important, as we saw, to have a follow-up from the emergency room going through surgery with an aesthetic group the ICU with the critical care group and with the active involvement of neurosurgeons in performing a timely, early and proper uh, procedure, technically speaking, with a large decompression. Currently, we are performing an important effort by the WHO for many of those interventions that could be cost effective in low and middle income countries to become the foundation to build the education of future trauma surgeons worldwide. Right now, we have eight countries in Africa that do not have neurosurgeons available for the whole country. We're speaking of countries of 10, 11 million inhabitants without a single neurosurgeon available to manage the patients. And the question is, is it that in those patients we do not have a brain trauma? So, what we are proposing right now, as part of a worldwide uh, group, the GIS or GIS initiative, is that in the centers where we have ample experience in the management of trauma, we could create a group that could create an educational process. Dr. Ferrara is going to speak about the international collaboration in trauma education, and it is an open invitation to all those interested in the management of trauma patients to collaborate with this type of initiatives. Uh, by uh, December 2016, we're going to have for the first time in Latin America the worldwide meeting on a, uh, advances in traumatology. It is the worldwide international conference on recent advances in neuro traumatology that is focused specifically on neuro trauma. So you are all invited. Thank you very much. Andres, this is one of the neurotrauma conference and this uh, concept of uh, extension. It's one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most of the uh, presentations that I've heard recently. I think this comment is interesting. Many low and mid-income countries have always believed in the dogma that if you open the cranium, Whenever you open the cranium, you rot it, or it will rot. We know that in many countries, mortality because of these types of injuries, which are not preventable, uh, are taking place every day. But uh, when a patient has a cranial inju injury, a lot of edema because of uh, firearms, um, the neurosurgeons used to do their incisions 15 by 15, and I think that we have to go beyond that paradigm. I think we have to be more aggressive in this regard, and what value do you think there is for this in areas where we don't have, where they sometimes don't even have a uh, 
a CT scan that they can get, um, trepanation or craniectomy. How can you do this when you don't have a neurosurgeon? Well, this is a very complex situation because it has to do with the human aspect in each one of the different specialties. There has been discussion for many years now on the part of many of the neurosurgeon groups that has to do with placing uh, this equipment in intensive care units. There are places where you do have the resources to monitor the intracranial uh, pressure, but the neurosurgeon doesn't want to do the surgery anyway. So there are discussions as to whether you should train other types of specialists and intensive care, a trauma surgeon, so that you can place this type of equipment there because the patient needs it and many neurosurgeons don't want to do this type of surgery in those conditions. More neurosurgeons prefer to do elective surgery instead of traumatic surgery. So imagine um, how much discussion there has been as to placing just a little bit of equipment for this. Ima imagine if you ask surgeons to do the type of surgery that military surgeons do. Uh, surgeons that have done, many of the surgeons that have done these types of surgeries in combat zones were not neurosurgeons. They were just general surgeons, but they did it because the patient needed it. So the group uh, in the WHO that we have been talking to, there's a, a neurosurgeons group, we're starting to discuss these issues. And so that you can have a clear idea, in certain African countries, some of the people that have more experience uh, operating in neurosurgery are not neurosurgeons. The idea would be to offer these people formal training so that over time these people can um, be t uh, have a degree as neurosurgeons so that they can continue to carry out these uh, this type of surgery. We have to be able to define very clear parameters as to the uh, competence and uh, training capability education so that we can have um, procedures that are safe and well done, but we have to discuss our reality areas that don't have the resources, whether human or material, and I think we have to do certain types of adaptations, identify the best options, and provide the support that they need so that they can develop neurosurgery as a specialty there in these areas and offer uh, processes that are much safer for our patients, but the patients deserve this, and it's only fair uh, from a social perspective to having everyone everyone have access to these cranial decompression if they need it. And what's your opinion as to uh, trepanectomy in emergency centers? Well, you need to have CT scan if you have um, the latest in CT scans where you can get it in 25, less than 25 minutes. Um, you don't have that much of a problem, but there are many areas where there are limited resources. In Colombia and in many other Latin American countries, we've seen emergency centers that have high trauma value and they don't have access to a CT scan. So in these types of centers, I think it would be important for us to go back to this complex scenario of trepanation so that we can identify extra subdural bleeding and then uh, carry out the necessary procedure. Thank you very much, Andres.